We celebrated his birthday as well, and so God has been good to all of us. God bless you, Mr. Henry, Brother Henry, Brother Henry on the yes. God bless you. <laughs> Happy belated birthday to both of you. Oh, thank you very much. Amen. And so tonight we're just going to continue uh, in the lesson of uh, living a life of victory, attaining victory over sin. Uh, remember that the last two weeks we discussed living a life of victory, attaining victory over sin, and how we should do this. And what we said was that we should know. We need to know how to do this, and that is in Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 10, showed us how we should know. We should understand and know basic Christian doctrine and why it is that our Christian living depends upon our Christian learning. We must have a knowledge, so we must know. In other words... How we live a life of victory, we must know why we are who we are, who God has made us to be in him, who God has made us to be through his grace and justification. We must understand who we are in Christ, amen, and understand that that justification by faith is just not a legal matter anymore between us and God, but it's a living relationship. And so that's what we reviewed over the last couple of weeks. We reviewed uh, justification as an act producing righteousness and sanctification, which is a process, which is also going to produce righteousness. So in these chapters, chapter six through Romans chapter eight, it's going to show us how to do that. Okay, so now that we know, what I did say is that in the next uh, few verses, verses 11 through 23 and onward, is going to show us how to put these facts that we know to work in our daily experience of becoming victorious and living a victorious Christian life. Okay, so let's begin. Okay, so verse 11 of Romans chapter 6 says, even so consider yourselves also dead to sin and your relation to it broken, but alive to God, living in unbroken fellowship with him in Christ Jesus. The King James Version says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm going to stop there for a moment just at that verse so that I can explain that verse to you. So to reckon here actually doesn't mean to suppose or think or have an idea. It's literally to take into account, to calculate, to estimate, to put to one's account. Where did we first hear this? If you can remember, we first heard this word reckon in Romans chapter 4. Some facts to know about this word reckon. It's used 41 times in the New Testament and 19 times in the book of Romans. And it comes from the Greek word logosomai. Now, I'm not telling you to write down this word. I'm just giving it to you there as a fact. I'm not going into detail about the Greek and all of that. What I do is give you just a basic instruction. But because it comes from that Greek word, that Greek word is actually dealing with reality. It's dealing with calculation. It's dealing with taking into account, to estimate, to put to one's account. So if I reckon, I legosomai, that my bank book has $25 in it, it has $25 in it. Otherwise, I'm deceiving myself. So this word is refer referring more to a fact. It's factual. 
than supposition or opinion. It doesn't matter what I think. What the word of God wants us to know is that it's factual. Amen. So if you want to look at that, you'd have to go back to Romans chapter four as your reference, because we've dealt with it before about reckoning, calculating um, and estimating. And we, we told you that it was a banking term. OK, and so when you go back to Romans chapter four and you read those verses from verses three through 24, you're going to see that word reckon quite a few times in that chapter and <clears throat> how um, Abraham counted himself or it was accounted to him his belief in God for righteousness. It was actually calculated, credited to him for righteousness, his belief in God. So now here it's dealing with reality and it wants us to know factually, not thinking or opinionated. It just wants us to know to believe what God says in his word. Just believe it. Don't argue with it. Don't have an opinion about it. This is just a fact. Amen. This is a fact. It's dealing with reality. Okay. It's dealing with reality. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin. I'm not going to try to justify it. I'm not going to try to argue it. I'm not going to try to uh, make a supposition about it. I'm not going to try to give an opinion about it. Paul is saying, consider yourselves dead to sin. That's a fact. And your relationship to it broken. But consider yourselves alive to God. Paul didn't want to tell us to feel as if we were dead to sin. Or even understand it fully, but to act on God's word and claim it for ourselves. Just act on God's word and claim it for yourself. So what's the example here? Consider cashing a check. If you're given a check, you believe the money is there. So what are you going to do in order to get that money? You're going to endorse the check. You're going to sign your name and you're going to collect the money. Yes. So this is what God is telling us to do. You're dead to sin. You're alive to God. Believe his word. And now act upon it. Act upon it. Just walk in him. Walk in, in that belief. Walk in that fact. Because even if you don't believe it, the facts are still going to be true. Okay? The facts are still going to be true. So in order to have victory in our Christian life, we must know. That's the first thing. Remember that we discussed this two weeks ago. We must know that that has a centering in our mind. But right now, we must reckon. We must understand what the word says. And that focuses on our heart. There's, a, there's another example that um, I have heard about as well. And, and many of you know it uh, coming from uh, our black history. Okay. So in, in, in um, 1863, President Lincoln issued his famous Emancipation Proclamation, freeing all slaves throughout the Confederacy. But even years later, there were certain places where that announcement had been kept secret. Right. And what happened? Those slaves that were in those places that didn't hear that they had been freed, they were still acting like slaves. No one told them the truth of their situation. When they found out that they were free, that changed their mind and that changed their action. So those of us who are free in Christ because of what his word said is foolish to still be walking in sin. Why? Because his word already told us that we're free. 
Hallelujah. His word has already declared to us that we are free. It's time to get the memo, hold on to it, believe it, trust it, hallelujah, and walk in it. And that's the way that you have victory in your Christian life. Amen. Hallelujah. So now we get to verse 12. And verse 12 through verse 23, we're probably not going to get all the way down to verse 23 tonight, but verse beginning at verse 12, it now tells us something that we have to do to obtain victory and live a life of victory and attain victory over sin. What does verse 12 say? It says, let not sin therefore rule as king in your mortal, your short-lived and perishable bodies to make you yield to its cravings and be subject to its lusts and evil passions. Hallelujah. Verse 13, do not continue offering or yielding your bodily members or your bodily parts and faculties to sin as instruments or tools of wickedness, but offer and yield yourselves to God as though you have been raised from the dead to perpetual life and your bodily members and faculties to God, presenting them as implements of righteousness. Glory to God. That is the next word that we are going to focus on, is yield. Yield. Y-I-E-L-D. Yield. And yielding focuses on the will. So verses 1... 12 through 23 are going to talk about yielding, okay? That's how we obtain and attain a life of victory over sin. We yield to God, not to the enemy. So the word yield is found five times in these verses, these Verses verse 12 to 33, particularly in verses 13, verse 16, and verse 19. So it's important to know the definition of what it means to yield and meaning in biblical terms. The word yield means to place at one's disposal, to present to offer as a sacrifice. So where does it tell us this in the word of God? It tells us in our reference, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And we're going to look at that. And it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. That's the biblical meaning. Amen. Presenting your bodies unto God to place at his disposal, to present it, to offer it as a sacrifice. Yes. This, how, how, so how do, how are we to yield? What are we supposed to do? That's what it says in the word. This act of yielding is an act of the will. It's, a, it's an act of your will, your own will. You're not going to be forced to do it. God is not going to come down and pummel you to do it. It's your will. 
based on the knowledge we have of what Christ has done for us. So if Christ was willing to sacrifice his life for us, to die for us, to shed his blood for us so that we can be saved, he expects that we will place ourselves and present ourselves and offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. So it lets us know that it's an intelligent act. It's not just an impulsive decision of the moment based on an emotional stirring. It's, it, it's an intelligent action, right? The Word of God is encouraging us in these two verses, verse 12 and 13, not to allow Satan to reign in our mortal body, in our, in our mortal body, our fleshly body right now, this body that will die and perish and we're not going to live forever. But right now, don't allow Satan to reign in our mortal body so that we're constantly obeying its lusts. Do not constantly yield your members of your body as tools, tools of unrighteousness to sin. A tool is an instrument that someone can pick up and use. And, you know, sometimes... <laughs> Even though we're Christian, we do allow ourselves to be used by the enemy sometimes. But this is what the Word of God is telling us. In order to obtain victory and live a life of victory over sin, this is what we have to do. Consciously decide, amen, to be used by God, not the enemy. Has anyone of us ever been used by as a tool? You don't have to answer. Don't open your phone and tell me who you are. <laughs> Glory to God. I mean, I, I myself have said, I think the enemy used me today. <laughs> Glory to God. But we have got to become conscious of the fact that because Jesus himself became a sacrifice for us, that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, and not to yield the members of our body, the parts of our body, whether it's our mouth, our lip, our tongue, our eyes, our hands. Oh, don't be hitting people and striking people. <laughs> uh, who did you tell off today? Who did you run off the road today? <laughs> Glory to God. Don't constantly yield the members of your body as tools of unrighteousness to sin, but once and for all, yield yourselves to God. Why? Because the same faculties that can yield to sin can likewise yield to God and commit holy acts. So if, if we can consciously decide to to do something bad and to do wrong and to, to do sinful acts, we can consciously decide to do the right thing. It was just this week as um, President-elect Biden uh, spoke and said, you know, we have decided, I mean, in the, in, in, in the Senate, not to work together, the two parties. He said, so if we've decided not to work together, the Congress and the Senate, that's a conscious decision that we've made. We're not going to work together. We're just going to oppose each other and not get anything done. We can come together and work together. Now, if that's in politics, it certainly can be in the spiritual life. Yes? Amen. So the same faculties that yield to sin can likewise yield to God and commit holy acts. Where do we find these verses? We find them, I'm going to give you the references now, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, which we just spoke about. We just read that, about yielding our bodies and offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. The next reference is 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 4, Verse 1. I'd like to read that. 
and 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1. Now, there are a lot of scriptures. I often tell you there are a lot of references, but we just choose a few so that we don't have to become bombarded. But as you do your further study, you're going to see some of those verses that I may not have given you tonight. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1 says, Furthermore, brethren, we beg and admonish you, in virtue of our union with the Lord Jesus, that you follow the instructions which you learn from us about how you ought to walk so as to please and gratify God, as indeed you're doing, and that you do so even more and more abundantly, attaining yet greater perfection in living this life. That's how you gain victory in this life. That's how you become more and more perfected or mature. Okay? That's that word perfection. Doesn't mean that you will be flawless, but it does mean that you will grow in maturity, in perfection, in the things of God. Amen? Glory to God. Hallelujah. And then... The next chapter is 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10 to 12. So it says, Once you were not a people at all, but now you are God's people. Once you were unpitied, but now you are pitied and have received mercy. Beloved, I implore you as aliens and strangers and exiles in this world to abstain from the sensual urges, the evil desires, the passions of the flesh, your lower nature that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves properly, honorably, righteously, among the Gentiles, so that although they may slander you as evildoers, yet they may be witnessing by your good deeds, come to glorify God in the day of inspection, when God shall look upon you wanderers as a pastor or shepherd looks over his flock. We are strangers. Once we become um, the children of God, we become aliens, strangers to this world's devices. And so we have to conduct ourselves in a way that becometh righteousness so that people can look at you and say, you know what? You're different. What is it? And why are you different? And you become a witness to them. Amen. That's what we want to do. That's who we want to become. He says, you were not a people at all before, but now you're God's people. You've received mercy. I beg of you. I implore you to abstain from the sensual urges, the evil desires, the passions of the flesh, everything else that people want to justify the word of God becomes my direction and my map, my compass. It tells me how I should live, what I should do. And so I choose to believe God's word and trust in his word. And the last reference is 1 Corinthians 6, verse 13 to 20. I may just read a couple verses down. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13 to 20. Okay. I'm actually going to uh, start from verse 15. So you can read the other verses on your own, but I'll start from verse 15 because it more pertains to me. Do you not see and know that your bodies are members of Bodily parts of Christ, the Messiah? Am I therefore to take the parts of Christ and make them parts of a prostitute? Never, never. 
Or do you not know and realize that when a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? The two, it is written, shall become one flesh. But the person who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun immorality and all sexual looseness. Flee from impurity in thought, word, or deed. Any other sin which a man commits is one outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, whom you have received as a gift from God, and you are not your own? You were bought with a price, purchased with the preciousness, and paid for, made his own. Then, or so then, honor God and bring glory to him in your body. These specific verses speaking about um, sexual immorality. But it's not limited to just sexual immorality. There are other things that we do that do not bring glory to God and also defile us. In other words, the focus does not have to just be on sexual immorality. There are other things that uh, the Bible speaks about that can also be linked to these scriptures. We must remember who we are, that we are bought with a price, that our bodies belong to the Lord, that we present them a living sacrifice to be used by the Lord. And so with that in mind, we move forward, we go about our daily lives, trying and living to please the Lord. Amen? Amen. And so <clears throat> that is speaking about how we are to yield. And I just wanted to just also put out there that it isn't a sin to be tempted. The sin is in the yielding. So you may be tempted, but if that's not a sin. The sin is when you actually yield to the temptation. Jesus himself was tempted. Jesus went into the wilderness, fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and right after his fast, who came to him? The enemy, the devil, came to tempt him, but he was able to defeat the devil and conquer him with the word. That's why it's so important for us to know the word, to, to, to use the word in its correct form, and to attack the enemy with the word, okay? Not our opinions, not the words of a song, not the other things that we think is going to defeat the enemy. The word is what will defeat the enemy. When you have the word in you, that's what you use. James chapter 1 Verse 13 to 15 is your reference, for it's not a sin to be tempted. The sin is in the yielding, okay? The sin is in the yielding. My dad used to say, you can not prevent a bird from dropping a piece of trash in your head, but you certainly can prevent him from making a nest in your head. Now, a nest takes some time to make. I've seen birds make nests on my property in my light. I'm like, when did this nest get here? All of a sudden, I see a nest. I see eggs. I see everything. And it's on my light that as soon as we come out, <laughs> you know, that little light that you have at your door it has a nice little, you know, concave area there. And they come and from time to time, we saw birds flying, not realizing that they were making a nest. They were bringing all sorts of leaves and trash and hair and feathers and all sorts of stuff. And it took time for them or for that bird to make that nest. So you can't prevent them from throwing trash. You can't prevent your mind from thinking certain things. But you certainly can prevent that nest from being made in your head, okay, by uh, focusing on the word of God and yielding yourself to God and to his word. So James chapter 1, verse 13 to 15, James chapter 1, verse 13 to 15 says, 
Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted from God. For God is incapable of being tempted by what is evil, and he himself tempts no one. But every person is tempted when he is drawn away, enticed, and baited by his own evil desire, his lust and his passions. Then the evil desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully matured, brings forth death. Uh, we see this with David. We're going to see it further down in this lesson. But my example is always David. David, he couldn't prevent himself from going on that roof and seeing Bathsheba, but he could have prevented himself from doing all the other things that he did to get her. OK, and uh, lying. And then you see that every member of his body was involved, his eyes and his mind and, and his body with the passion and then thinking up and concocting uh, to kill and to to destroy the husband of this woman who he knew he had slept with her and wanted to hide it and all these different things. You see his all his members become completely absorbed in the sin. And then what does he do after? It's no wonder he says, uh, purge me with hyssop, wash me from head to toe, that I may be clean. Thank God he realized his sin and received that forgiveness. I wanted to just do one more. Uh, why does the Lord want the believer's body? Why does the Lord want the believer's body? We're to yield. And now he wants us to yield with our body. Why? He says it, our bodies are the temple, right? We just read it. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And he wants us to use it for his glory. That's how we obtain victory over sin. We yield ourselves and then we allow our bodies to be God's temple. And he wants us, or he wants to use it for his glory. Where do we see that? We see that in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20. We just read that. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20. We read 1 Corinthians 6, 13 to 20. Um, I began a little bit below, but now you can just put 19 to 20. So we're not going to read that again your reference. Our bodies are God's temple and he wants us to use, he wants to use it for his glory. It's 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Then the next uh, reference is Philippians 1. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Repeat that. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. I'm looking for it. All right. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21 says, Okay. It says, um, This is in keeping with my own eager desire and persistent expectation and hope that I shall not disgrace myself nor be put to shame in anything, but that with the utmost freedom of speech and unfailing courage, now as all, always, here to Christ the Messiah will be magnified and get glory and praise in this body of mine and be boldly exalted in my person, whether through by life or through by death. For me to live is Christ. In other words, his life is in me. And to die is gain, the gain of the glory of eternity. Wherever I'm going, whatever I'm going to do, I want God to get the glory in this body of mine, in this temple of mine. If I open my mouth, I want it to be used for his glory, whether speaking for him, 
singing for him, talking for him, whatever I do with my hands, whether sharing or giving to another person, helping somebody, I want him to get the glory. Amen. We, we just don't just do things because oh, we can do it and we have a mouth so we can just, you know, run off and people and say things. We have to think before we do. And so this is what Paul was saying. Whatever I do, I don't want to put shame in anything and I don't want to put shame to God. I want to give him the glory in my body. That he is magnified. He is exalted. He is made large in my life. And get the glory and praise. I like that. In this body of mine. Amen. And be boldly exalted in my person. In me. Look at me. I want somebody to look at me and say, What is it about you that you're so different? How do you handle a position like that? How do you handle persecution like that? How are you so patient? Has anyone ever told you that? There's just something different about you, my sister. There's something different about you. I just love the way that you handle things. It's because God is getting the glory in you. And he wants to use your body as his temple. And he wants to use it for his glory. The next Reference is Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Yeah. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. And I have so many um, sticky notes in my Bible that now I usually have them like where I'm going <laughs> to go to the reference and I've got to be flipping through all these little sticky notes that I forget to remove. So that's Colossians. why you hear me going through. So it's Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. What does it say? It says... So, well, the King James Version says, Mortify therefore your members which are up on the earth. But the Amplified Version says, So kill, deaden, deprive of power. I like that. Deprive of power, mortify, kill it, deaden it. The evil desire lurking in your members, your body parts. Those animal impulses and all that is earthly in you that is employed in sin. What are they? Sexual vice, impurity, sensual appetites, unholy desires, and all greed and covetousness. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, it's not just sexual impurities and sexual sins. There are other things. There's greed, there's, a, there's um, covetousness, there's thinking evil of other people. What does the word say? It says, for that is idolatry. Remember when we learned about idolatry, it's putting other things before God, exalting something yeah. else before God. That is idolatry. The defying of self and other created things instead of God. So that's why the Lord wants our body. He wants us to kill to deaden, to deprive of power. Don't let it get greater than the spiritual man. And 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 um, my 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 mom always used to say, you know how you feed your body daily. You feed your body every minute. We're in the fridge. <laughs> every minute we got to get something out of the fridge. Sometimes we're not even hungry. I know. I know. I know. I'm a witness. I'm not even hungry. I just want to fill this void in my stomach. <laughs> but sometimes we got to deprive ourselves in the same way that we fill our physical bodies is the same way that sometimes we fill our spiritual bodies, but we don't fill it with the right thing. So he is saying to us, kill it, mortify it, sacrifice it, deprive it of power, those sensual desires and all the things that would keep you from 
living for the Lord. Those evil desires, yes, mortify them. Why? Because God wants to use the members of the body as tools for building his kingdom and weapons for fighting his enemies. We're going to be coming down, but I just wanted to get to that last reference, which speaks about the smallest little member. I think you know it. The smallest little member. It's in James chapter 3, verse 5 to 6. James chapter 3, verse 5 to 6. Who would think that this little member could create such damage and havoc to people? This member is called our tongue. James chapter 3, verse 5 to 6 is the next reference. Pertaining to our bodies are God's temple and he wants to use it for his glory. But what does he say in James chapter 3, verse 5 and 6? He says, even so, the tongue is a little member, and it can boast of great things. See how much wood and how much a great forest a tiny spark can set ablaze? Mm -hmm. Look at all those fires in, in California. You'd never know that it's a little bit of something that would set that place ablaze, right? But the, the, the Bible says and likens our tongue to a fire. The tongue is a world of wickedness set among our members, contaminating and depraving the whole body and setting on fire the wheel of birth, the cycle of man's nature, being itself ignited by hell. And it goes on, you can read it further, to say every other animal can be tamed, but the tongue cannot be tamed. Mm -hmm. You can just open your mouth and say something and destroy someone for life. That's why the tongue is a little member, but we want God to be able to use even those little members that we think are just little members, but can be used greatly to destroy one another. Every area of our lives must be yielded to the Lord. Amen? Every area of our lives. And I mentioned the tongue because it's just not about the different sexual things, but our mouths, our minds, our eyes, our hands, everything. Every member must be used as tools for the building up of God's kingdom and weapons for fighting his enemies. Amen? And so we are going to end here, but next week we're going to try to finish up on um, the rest of these verses, verses 14 to 23. And then we're going to try to finish up on um, those verses. I hope that you were blessed. Amen tonight.